Good morning. We are Pauline and Randy Phillips. And we are Curtis and Diana Alexander, part of your West Coast family from California. We are so happy for this opportunity to welcome you to Columbia Community Center streaming service this morning. So we invite you to pray with us at this time. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for this hour. We thank you for the presence of your spirit. We invite you to be with us, to tabernacle with us, to bless us as we worship today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And remember, this is the day that the Lord has made. Please rejoice and be glad in it. We hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Happy Sabbath, CCC. My name is Tia Jeffrey. I would like to bring your attention to the following announcements from our electronic bulletin. If you would like to join our mailing list and receive the bulletin, please go to columbiacentersda.org forward slash bulletin. You can also view the latest bulletin there. Once again, CCC, thank you for coming through for our Thanksgiving distribution last Sunday. Every child received a pair of gloves to keep them warm this winter, and many of you already dropped off socks for our Christmas sock drive. Socks for our children and adults can be dropped off on Sunday, December the 5th, between 9 o'clock and 10.30 a.m., Thursday, December 9, between 10 o'clock a.m. and 3 o'clock p.m., or in the male vestibule at any time between now and 10 o'clock a.m. on Sunday, December the 19th. As we move toward this special holiday season, when we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we especially miss the fellowship and friendships we have with our church family. Because COVID has impacted us in so many ways for a long time, Member Care and Nurture will host a parking lot Christmas on Sabbath, December 11, from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. to bring our church family together for an afternoon of fellowship. Special music will be provided by a guest musician as we sing our favorite Christmas carols. We will enjoy s'mores, hot cider, and hot chocolate as we gather around the fire pits, and a small token of our love will be provided as well. This will be a great time to see our members and just have a fun time together. As always, we will follow COVID safety precautions with masks, sanitizers, and social distancing. Please plan to come with family and friends. Bring your singing voices and bundle up to stay warm and cozy as we come together. We will conclude the evening with a brief devotion to end the Sabbath. You don't want to miss this event. Today, the CCC family would like to recognize Adrian Wesney, Jackie Armstrong, and Hercules Pigney, who celebrated birthdays this past week. We also recognize my aunt and uncle, John and Suzanne Wooldridge, who celebrated their wedding anniversary this week. We hope your day was blessed and wish you a wonderful year. Again, if you would like to view our announcements or join our mailing list, please go to columbiacentersda.org forward slash bulletin. Please join me as we approach the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we come with thanksgiving and praise. First of all, that you are God. We just thank you so much for being our God, being our creator and our sustainer. And we look forward to your soon coming, that you might take us home to live in glory with you forever. Until then, Lord, we ask that you continue to just accept our praise and thanksgiving for all that you do for us day by day. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word that we might feed upon it each day for our spiritual nourishment. We thank you for the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who had such a heart of compassion and love for us that he gave his life that we might spend eternity with you. So Lord, thank you for giving us a heart of compassion that when we see others in need, we might be as open and as gracious as you are in addressing the needs of others. Father, thank you so much for your blessings each day of this week, for blessing our families, our children, our parents. We thank you for your blessing upon our sick and shut in. And Lord, we just thank you so much for just continuing to be near us. We simply ask that you help us to sense your presence because you've already promised that you will never leave us and will never forsake us. So thank you for your promises, which are true. We thank you, Father, for another Sabbath day in which we can come and hear your word. So we ask and thank you for an anointing of your spirit upon our speaker for the day. And may we feed upon your word this day, not only to hear it, Lord, but to do your will. It's our prayer in Jesus' name and thanksgiving. Amen.
that you seek, I invite you to sing with us this morning that he is our all in all. Let's sing together, you are my strength. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Let's try that one more time. You are my strength when I am weak. Let's sing it all together. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Oh, say, Jesus, say, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy. Because of who you 
Changing you, we have. 
Good morning, family, and happy Sabbath. I certainly hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday this past Thursday. Hopefully you were able to celebrate with family and friends from far as well as near. I know we certainly did, and we are still enjoying that sweet fellowship. Today, we want to continue our series that we started, The Christian Journey, and the subtitle for today's message is Seeking God. We had discussed in the previous two weeks that one of the main purposes or the chief objective of these spiritual practices and disciplines is to enhance our experience with God. So that it's not just an intellectual enterprise, but it is one that is experiential, not just affirming a list of beliefs and doctrines that we ascribe to, but to experience the transforming power as well as enjoying the presence on a daily basis of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And so today we want to continue. We want to pick up where we left off last week on seeking God. But before we begin, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask for God's presence to be with us. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful that you have given us your dear Son and our blessed Savior. And he has promised that he would not only give us his Holy Spirit, who would lead us and to guide us, but he would be actually in us, taking up residence. So this morning, as we teach and as we share, I'm asking that our minds and hearts will be enlightened and uplifted so that you will speak to us and we will hear you as your voice resonates in our hearts and in our minds individually and then collectively as a church family. Thank you so much for hearing and for answering this humble prayer in Jesus name, amen. Seeking God, if you have your Bibles, I'm gonna invite you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah in chapter 55 and verse six. And this is going to be a key passage, a key text. In Isaiah 55 and verse six, the word of God proclaims, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now, when you look at the first verse, the first couple of verses of Isaiah 55, this is a profound statement that the Lord is offering to not only Isaiah, but to the people of God. They are getting ready to go into Babylonian captivity because of their disobedience, because of their recalcitrance, and because they have not obeyed the Lord. And he is letting them know that just like you need physical food that requires money, he was offering them spiritual food that would provide sustenance, not just in this life, but eternal life. And it was free. That's why he says, come, 
even though you don't have money, come and buy of me. You see, the thing about food, about physical food, while it is exquisite, wonderful aroma that adds to the taste and the flavor, just as we participated in a, a scrumptious meal on Thursday, on Thanksgiving Day, the energy that we derived from that meal was only temporary. In other words, when I woke up this morning before coming to church and resuming my duties and responsibilities, I had to eat again. I could not just rely upon the meal I had last Thursday. The benefit and the effect of our physical food, physical food rather, is temporary. It is not lasting. But the food that Jesus Christ offers that he was giving to the people of God through his manservant Isaiah, which is also applicable and a wonderful invitation to us, is that he tells us, I have something that will create in you a fountain of living water, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, that will well up into everlasting and eternal life. And it doesn't require money, but you have to seek me. And this is one of the primary themes that we want to zero in on today, because the Lord is letting us know here that the purpose and objective of the spiritual disciplines is that we can experience God. I can know him for myself. And I'm talking about an experience that keeps me rooted and grounded in him, especially when difficult times come and my faith is being tested. You see, this matter of religion and spirituality, it deals with the, the nuts and the bolts of life. If you've been in this journey for any amount of time, you know that you are going to be faced with death. You're going to be faced with trials and temptations and hardships and heartache and heartbreak. There might even be challenges that will, that will erode one's mental health capabilities. You might find yourself disjointed even within the household of faith. No matter what the circumstance is, whether it's financial implosion, whether it's bankruptcy, whether it's foreclosure, whether it's not being able to fulfill your ultimate dream and objective, it could be a failed marriage. It could be disjointed and broken relationships with your children and other significant others. It could be an absence of faith where the enemy has worn you down. It might be substance abuse. It could be any number of things. It might be apathy. It might be agnosticism. Maybe you've gotten to a point where you don't really know if you truly believe in all the things that you have been taught from a child. The racial inequities and disparities and the tension that we see in our society that is pulling the social fabric apart. And we see it happening even within the church. The Lord is saying, in spite of all the problems and issues that you are experiencing and going through, he wants us to understand that he is still there. He is still powerful. He still can be the captain of your soul and of your life. He is indeed the King of kings and Lord of lords. His word declares that the kingdom of God is here. It is present. It is with his people. But if you and I don't know him personally, if all this is is just intellectualism or systematic theology until it becomes a part of my very spiritual, and even my physical sustenance and DNA until I have this experience with him, all of this just becomes another fad or another philosophy or another religion. And so the Lord is throwing down a market here in Isaiah 55 and verse six. He says, if you seek me, if you seek me, then you will find me but we must seek him. So I want you to keep in mind just a couple of key points. Number one, the whole purpose of the spiritual practices and disciplines is that we can have an experience with God. Not just one of emotionalism, although emotion is, is involved in it, 
but an experience with him. In order to have this experience with him, I need to seek him. And in this seeking, the fruit of this seeking is going to be a revival. The fruit of seeking God is going to be a personal and a corporate revival. Ellen White gives us a powerful quotation, just two sentences. Listen to what she writes. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. Comes from volume one of Selected Messages, page 121. That is what we need. Uh, I have been praying that God would bless us with a building and he has done that. We continue to pray that the renovation will move forward expeditiously so that we can resume in-person service and worship. And the Lord is doing that. But I present to you, that is not our greatest need of having the building at 9121 Red Branch Road. Our greatest need that the servant of the Lord says is for a revival to take place. A revival that means that I find greater joy in my relationship with Jesus Christ and in service to others than anything that I possibly could experience in this life where my utmost desire is to worship him and to be in his presence, where I am being transformed and changed into his likeness, where I'm experiencing the comfort that comes from knowing that the presence of God is walking with me and holding me and keeping me, even when I'm going through the midst of trial and great loss. The past two weeks I have seen and we have experienced at least five to six deaths of dear friends and colleagues and a professor and holding their families together. And one family in particular that's a part of our household of faith, it seems as though they're just being bombarded week after week with one tragedy after another. How do we hold on to the blessed hope that we have so that we're just not talking ourselves into a better feeling or emotion, but it has gripped us because we are convicted that the promises of God are true. When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, even when you are facing health crisis. This is why the spiritual principles and the, sp and the spiritual practices and the disciplines are so important because it leads us into a more intimate and deep experience with God. And with this experience comes a revival that impacts every part and every aspect and every nuance of my life. Well, I want to echo the prayer that David, we uh, prayed and recited in Psalm 85 and verse six, where David says, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? This is the reason why we're going through this. This is the reason why we are studying together on seeking God, the Christian journey, so that we will have a personal and individual revival and walk with the Lord, but that will then happen throughout our entire church family. There will be this revival where we have an experience with God. It is individualized, but be, it becomes a collective movement so that what we see happening in the church in Acts chapter 2 in fact, the entire book of Acts, we will then begin to see it happening at CCC SDA. And even if you're tuning in and you're not a member of our church, but you're a member at your own church, the prayer is that no matter where you go, no matter who you are worshiping with, that the people of God will experience this revival as well as this reformation so that we can then begin to fulfill the mission of Jesus Christ of warning men and women that he is coming back again, making a clarion call so that there can be decisions made for the kingdom 
and for the master. So I've got to seek him. I've got to throw myself and deliver myself or place myself, all my emotions, my entire temperament, my aspirations, all of my proclivities, positive as well as negative, a complete surrender of myself into his hands. Now we want to get into not only the theoretical side of seeking God, but we're also going to get into how do we do this? But I want us just to examine just a few passages of why this is so important, why this is just not religious jargon. God tells us in the first passage I want us to look at, 1 Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 19. And 1 Chronicles 22 and verse 19, Now seek the Lord your God, with all your heart and soul. Now, the context here is King David, who is giving instruction to his son Solomon, who succeeded him as the king. You'll recall that David actually wanted to build a sanctuary, but the Lord didn't permit him to do that because he was a man of blood. He had fought many battles, had killed many of the enemies of God's people. And God has said, well, David, no, you can't be the one to, to build this temple I'm going to have your son Solomon do it. But what you can do is that you can make the preparations. And so David gathers an immense amount of gold and silver and bronze and iron and, and, and all of the resources that were necessary to build this temple. And then as you continue to read there in, in chapter 22 of First Chronicles, First Chronicles, the Lord actually gave David, and then Solomon, peace amongst all the nations so that Solomon would be able to build the temple of God without having any interruptions with other countries, rival countries uh, coming against them or create, starting a war. So the Lord took care of the political environment. So now the table is set. David has gathered all the resources. The Lord has given them peace at, in every direction and on every hand. And so here's David's instructions to Solomon. Now, verse 19, now seek the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Build the sanctuary of the Lord God so that you can bring the ark of the Lord's covenant and the holy vessels of God into the temple built to honor the Lord's name. He tells Solomon very specifically, you need to seek the Lord, but not just seeking him, but with all your heart and all your soul. So what is the lesson that that had? What's the lesson there for us today? When you and I need to seek the Lord and he is asking us and he has told us in Isaiah, if you seek me, you will find me. But it has to be done 100%. James Cleveland used to have a song back in the day, 99 and a half just won't do. The Lord needs 100% of us. There is no area in my life that is sacrosanct. In other words, an area that I put to the side and I exclude God from that area. Nothing is withheld from him. When we are seeking him, when I'm asking God to do a mighty work in me, I have to surrender myself completely to him. And as we'll get into the study today, we'll discover that at the nucleus of seeking God is surrender. In fact, there can be no true seeking until there is a hundred percent surrender. With all my heart, with all my mind, with all of my soul and all of my truth. You see, the question I have to ask you, as well as asking myself, is that in my journey thus far, have I truly sought out the Lord? And in my seeking, have I sought him with all of me? Or have I held back in one area or a couple of areas of my existence? The book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, a very familiar passage that we all know. And it is impossible to please God without faith. 
Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Have you ever lost your keys or misplaced your phone? Uh, I have, unfortunately. In fact, a number of us have to the point where individuals who are always thinking and not sleeping have come up with uh, uh, various devices and locator devices that you can attach on your key ring or on your phone, or you can use your phone. There are apps now that will help you find your keys. But if you before the apps came out and all these locating devicing, device tools, if I lost my keys, I would search the, my house high and low. I would go in my car uh, that that uh, that I had the key to. They actually the the key to one car, and I thought, well, maybe I left uh, the key to the Porsche in the in the in, in that car. But I would go through everything, checking all my coat pockets, looking in my desk, going everywhere, tearing the house up trying to find the keys. I would do it wholeheartedly. And then finally I would stop and I would pray and I say, Lord, I need you to help me. Likewise, the Lord is saying, just like you're trying to find something of value that you have lost and you search with it with all of your hearts, this is how you need to search for me, to sincerely seek him. I present to you today, friends, that as it relates to these spiritual practices, when I'm truly seeking God, I'm not giving God scraps and leftovers of my time, my energy, my intellectual prowess. No, I'm not going to rush in and give God a three minute prayer or skim over my Sabbath school lesson because I'm late for a meeting. No, when I'm earnestly seeking him, I'm going to pursue him. And this is what the author of Hebrews is saying. Those who sincerely seek him. I want you to ask yourself that question. Have you sincerely sought the Lord? Have you really spent time with him in his word? Of opening the passage or you're studying something and then you're asking all of these uh, inductive and deductive questions and then waiting for the spirit to convict you, waiting for this truth to wash over you and to flow through you because the Holy Spirit will bring to your mind exactly where your foibles are, bringing conviction. Are we seeking him earnestly? Listen to what the author in First Corinthians Chronicles 16 and verse 11 says, search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. I can remember when I was courting my wife at Oakwood College, now Oakwood University, and she would not give me the time of day. Wouldn't give me the time of day initially. And then finally, the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of her and convicted her and said, well, I need to give, I need to really talk to him. But I had to continue to pursue her. I had to convince her. I had to make a compelling and a convincing argument, if you please, in a persuasive and a loving and an endearing way. The Lord here is telling us, as David is once again telling Solomon, you need to search for the Lord. In other words, I've got to spend time with him. I just can't rush in at the, at, 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 at the beginning of my day, especially if I've awakened up, awakened late, and I just want to hurry up and get through the devotional so I can at least check it off the list. No, I've got to spend, and you're going to need to spend time with him, seeking him. Sometimes I, I have just said, Lord, I don't even know what to pray for. I don't even know where to begin. I need you to make me willing to be made willing 
to obey you. I need you to open up my mind so I can understand. There's so much scar tissue from previous sins and old habits and inclinations and propensities, and I have started and stopped. I have stalled and stuttered, and the enemy comes in like a flood, and he causes me to remember all of the false starts that I've had with you, and then the sea of discouragement and depression sweeps over me. And I'm wondering, why am I even doing this? I'm, the Lord can't possibly want me anymore because of all the problems and the mistakes that I have made. God's word is telling us, listen, you've got to search for him. Jesus is saying, if you come to me, I will in no wise cast you out. But you have got to make up your mind and set your heart and your face like a flint towards the master as we search for him and as we seek him. David writes in Psalm, the ninth division in verse 10, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Let me stop right there. Listen to what the Lord says. He says, he will not forsake you if you are seeking him. So that means then that when I make a mistake and I mess up and I sin and I falter knowingly, the master is telling me here and in his word that if we confess our sins, he is righteous and just to forgive us of all of our sins and then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1 and verse 9 and when I fall on the rock and I am broken and I confess my sins, the Lord gives me the promise of his divine forgiveness. He says, I will remove your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. I will remember it no more. I will cast it into the depths of the sea. And God never goes deep sea fishing. He says, for those who seek me, I will never, never forsake you. Well, in Amos chapter five and verse four, for thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. This is the beauty of seeking God. When I seek him, even in the process of being transformed, even when I'm dealing with the issues of life and of the flesh, when I am seeking him, God takes me and he forgives me and he aids me and he strengthens me and he is changing me through his Holy Spirit. And he's saying this whole process is how you become alive unto me. So I hope that you can make the connection. This is why the spiritual practices are so critical every single day. Even when I sin and mess up past it, that is the prime time when you need to fall on your knees and run back to him, especially in the face of defeat. Because these spiritual practices, as I'm studying his word in prayer, in meditation, in service, in fasting, all of these are tools spiritual tools that the Lord uses in this process that is changing us into his likeness for the service of others. And as I'm going through these practices, there is this level of engagement. There is an encounter. When you open your word and you are first asking God to give you his Holy Spirit, the same spirit that inspired these authors to transcribe God's thoughts into human language that is codified in the word of God. The same spirit that moved them to write it is the same spirit that we are asking that will help us to understand. And the Lord then is giving us the promise and the assurance of his word. And that is having an impact upon our lives. We are feeding the inner man. 
And there is this dynamic incarnational model that is taking place in us, which is how we become transformed. It is deepening this love experience that you and I are having with the master in these spiritual practices and in these disciplines as I'm opening his word. And then when I fall on my knees and I have time to talk to him and then listening to him respond back to me. And I'm seeking him with all of my heart. I would present to you today, church family, that you need to carve out. Yes, you need to segregate some time that is your worship time, your holy time, not for family worship, but your personal time with Jesus. Early in the morning, late at night, in the noonday, noon hour. Remember Daniel? He had three times of prayer early in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. You look at your schedule. All I'm saying is set out some time that nothing and no one can interfere with. It is your time when you are seeking God earnestly with all of your heart. Knowing that he is going to fulfill his word because he says, those who earnestly seek me, I will never forsake them. This is how we live. Real quickly, I want to give you three quick examples of individuals who sought out the Lord. And it happened at different times in their life. The first one was Moses. If you have your Bibles, look at Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, Moses is uh, up in years now. The Lord has asked him to lead the people of God. They have been recalcitrant. They have been stubborn. They have been hard-headed. And the Lord has given Moses, though, multiple promises and indicators that he is with him and will be with him. In Exodus 33, uh, Moses is a little disturbed at, because God wants him to lead the people. And therefore, Moses seeks out the Lord and asks him for some very specific things. Exodus 33 and beginning with uh, verse 12 and 13. Then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and you also you have also found grace in my sight verse 13 now therefore i pray this is moses speaking now therefore i pray if i have found grace in your sight show me now your way that i may know you and that i may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people verse 14 and he said god speaking my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Verse 17. So the Lord said to Moses, I also will do this thing that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight and I know you by name. Verse 18. And he said, please show me your glory. Here is an example where Moses is having this encounter with God. He is talking with him. He is communing with him. And Moses is seeking God. He wants God. And the Lord has already told him, I'm going to be with you, Moses. My presence is going to go with you. But Moses says, I want a little bit more, Lord. I need you to show me your glory. Now, we don't have time to look at the rest of that. But when you go uh, from uh, verse 19 on through verse 23, Lord tells Moses, listen, you can't handle it to see me face to face because you would die. But this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to place you over to the cleft of this rock of the mountain. And then I'm going to take my hand and cover your face. And then I'm going to cause you to be able to see the backside of my glory as I pass by. Hid in the cleft of the rock. The point is Moses was diligent and persistent in seeking God. Even though the Lord had given him the promise, I'm going to be with you and my presence will go with you. Moses still wanted more. 
He said, Lord, I want to see your face. I want to see your glory. I want to see your goodness. I want to experience this myself in a more intimate way. I want to go deeper into understanding who you are and the impact that you're having upon my life. Because if I'm going to be able to do service and lead your people, I need to be blessed with a double portion, a quadruple portion of your power and of your might and of your glory. And God honored that request. Why? Because Moses was fulfilling the directive, the divine directive that God had always given and continues to give to us today. Those who seek him will find him. So the obvious question today is, have you sought the Lord? Has your search for God been wholehearted or has it been haphazard? Or has it been like a hoe cake? My black history tells me that as I've shared with you before, our forefathers, as they were working the plantations, they did not have an opportunity to take a full lunch break as Folklore tells us they had to eat out in the field. And so they had a hoe cake and, and, and a little bit of meal, a little bit of oil, uh, but the cake would only be able to be cooked on one side as they cooked that meal and that oil on a hoe, on the metal part of the hoe. But they were not able to flip it. So they ended up just having a cake that was done on one side, but raw on the other. Is this how we have pursued our relationship with Jesus? Is this how we have had to go after him? Not wholeheartedly, but done on one side, but spiritually undone or raw on the other. So here is Moses seeking the Lord, asking for more and more and more. And guess what? God answers his prayer, but is tempered with God's grace because if God had done what Moses would have, what Moses initially requested, he would have been instantly consumed. But here is what God wants to do with us and how he will honor the request and your pursuit of God as you are seeking him with your whole heart. Second person is David. Book of Psalm 63, verse 1. We find uh, uh, this wonderful and marvelous request from David. He is in the throes of the rebellion of his son Absalom, you'll recall. Absalom is trying to usurp the kingdom from his father. He has defamed his father. He has uh, captured a group of rebellious and corruptible young men and women. They have staged the coup. David has had to leave at midnight with a special and a small entourage. And Absalom has gone, invaded and taken the kingdom on the throne. And then he committed a grave offense. Uh, David's other wives and concubines uh, that were left there. Solomon sleeps with them on the top balcony of, of, of the palace in the view of all the people, announcing his intention to overthrow his father as king. David is having to run like a fugitive, just like he ran during the days of Saul. He's an older man now, but he has learned that it is better to put his trust in men rather than relying on princes. And listen to what David says in Psalm 63 and verse 1. O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. You in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water, early will I seek you. David doesn't ask for revenge 
He's not motivated by retaliation. He doesn't ask the Lord, please send a strong retinue, retinue of soldiers that can suppress this rebellion that Absalom has staged unjustifiably against me. No, David says, I'm going to seek you, Lord. In the midst of struggle, in the midst of being tried and tested, I am going to seek you. Is that what you have done? And is that what you're doing when you find yourself in the valley of temptation, going through the rigors, the shadow of death, tremendous disappointments? Are we seeking him? Right now, our country is in a, a period of racial disparities. This young man in Georgia, being hunted down like an animal simply because he was jogging while black. The racial disharmony and prejudice and bias and inequities in our judicial system is ripping our country apart. It is creating walls of animus and hostility that have the intention of keeping us apart and separate. Now is the time, in addition to calling for social justice, but also for righteous justice, because the enemy, the real enemy of the soul, it's not the police department. It's not a white supremacist group. We have to deal with them, but the real enemy, the one who is behind it all, the mastermind, is Satan himself, the evil one, the arch enemy of God. He is the one that is trying to separate you and keep you from the loving communion and the power of our Lord and our Savior. Well, we talked about Moses as I close now. We talked about David. The last person I want to show and demonstrate to you of what it means to seek God is good King Josiah. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and verse 3, we find a wonderful story here, but you have to remember what happened. Josiah became king when he was just a child, about eight years old. And he was taught by the priests, protected and then taught by the priests, became a child king but there was something unique about Josiah. In 2 Chronicles 34 and verse 3, during the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, a teenager, and then coming into his early 20s, Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor David. Then in the 12th year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines, the Asheroth poles, and the carved idols and cast images. We don't have time to go through the whole litany of Josiah's life and his reign, but the thing that is important, he started seeking the Lord as a child. And when he got into his early 20s, he then as, as a result of seeking the Lord and the Lord communing with him and giving him strength, he started the path of reformation, which is why he has the moniker, Good King Josiah. All because he sought the Lord. Because he was in the process of seeking God. Because when you seek God, you are pursuing to intensify this experience with him. And it is this experience with God that brings about this revival. Now, I said at the outset of our study today, as I close, that at the heart of seeking God is the whole notion of surrender. You can't truly seek him unless you have fully surrendered. And this is where we're going to pick up when we resume again on part four of the Christian journey. What does it mean to surrender? How 
do I surrender? Some people think that surrendering simply means that you stop certain sins or bad habits or you eradicate certain traits that are uncomplimentary and unchristlike. And I would present to you that is part of the problem right there. Real surrender is talking about the surrender of yourself. The giving up of sins and problems and habits that are unchristlike is the result, it is the fruit of when you give all of yourself to Jesus. My prayer today, that as you and I take the time every single day of seeking God, of searching for him, and holding on to the promise that he said he would not forsake us or let us go in that process. We are now putting up and constructing an economy, which is the experience that God is having with us. And in this experience, there is this divine transaction where he is changing me and he is communing with me and I am communing with him. If that is your prayer today, if that is your desire, then I invite you to bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have given us a clear and a definitive message and a path and a process on how we can surrender our hearts to you and then receive that brand new heart where we can receive the infilling and the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Jesus, that you promised that as long as I seek you wholeheartedly and sincerely, that you will not forsake me. You will not leave me alone. I thank you for that. So seal us today, Lord Jesus, especially in this season of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, not just for the material benefits and blessings of life, but because of the promise that you have given us of eternal life. Thank you. Now continue to watch over us, continue to hold us and keep us. And the palm of your hand is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you today. We look forward to seeing you next Sabbath. Now is the time for us to respond to God's love and provisions. Let us return a thankful tithe and give our generous free will offerings. CCC members may do so by using our online giving link on our church website on your screen. Thank you for being faithful as he is faithful. For those of you who are viewing our service for the very first time, or perhaps you have been viewing on occasion and have been blessed by this ministry and would like to support it, you can make a donation to the church by using your PayPal and or Cash app as indicated on the screen. Thanks to all for your support. Thank you for fellowshipping with us here at Columbia Community Center. May God be victorious in your life this week, and we look forward to worshiping with you again next Sabbath.